What would Radiohead's True Love Waits sound like if we used 31 notes instead of 12? I teamed up with fellow musicians and YouTubers Steven Weigel and Braylon Addison to figure that out. The process was challenging, but enlightening. It's not every day that you're afforded the opportunity to bend the fabric of Western tonal harmony and reconceptualize a familiar song in an entirely new system of music. So today, I'd like to take you behind the scenes of that and show you just how this arrangement came to be. Let's get microtonal. Uh, the thing that I wanted to do that I suggested to Levi initially that we later did was exaggerate the distance between the A and the A-flat in the bass using sub-minor and super major chords. This is Steven Weigel, a composer, educator, popular podcast host, and probably one of the most well-versed microtonal theorists on the planet. If you exaggerate them in either direction, you get a very large interval instead of it just sounding like a semitone. So imagine that your A has become A half-sharp, and your A-flat has become A sesquiflat. Now you have a larger distance between the two notes, such that that root movement doesn't sound normal, but everything else still fits in. Whoa, 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 hang on. Super major, sub minor, sesquiflat? Let's back up a minute and start from the beginning. This is a lumitone, an instrument favored by microtonalists like Steven because of their inherent ease at approaching non-standard tuning systems. With the lumitone, you can easily map out just about any tuning you want onto its isomorphic keyboard layout. Steven is playing this part in a tuning system called 31 Tone Equal Temperament, often abbreviated as 31 Tet or 31 EDO for equal divisions of the octave, or simply as 31. This tuning system equally divides an octave into 31 discrete pitches. This is very different from our familiar 12 note system and yields chromatic pitches which are much closer together than what we're used to. Here's a chromatic scale in 12 EDO. And here's a chromatic scale in 31 EDO. And don't worry too much about the notation, that's a whole nother video for hopefully a, a very, very distant day. What do you like about 31? What makes it unique? There's so many things you could say to answer that question, but I think from a practical perspective, the very exciting thing about 31 is it is a great compromise between giving you enough notes in the octave to have like practically infinite colors um, while also being fairly usable. Because you know, the more notes you have per octave, the less easy it's going to be to use that tuning. And then the less notes you have per octave, you know, the less chromatic variety you get. So 31 is kind of like this gold spot where it's just about right. So let's dig into some of these new colors. With 31 notes to the octave, we can still build our basic triads, the major and minor. Only now they're actually more in tune than the ones we have access to in 12. Let's compare the major chord of 12 with the major chord of 31. Now let's try the minor chord. There's a few different ways you can go about chord building in 31. I personally like to relate everything back to the chromatic 31 scale through Edo Step. Edo Step. Edo Step is a system that plainly assigns notes to numbers going up the chromatic 31 scale. In order to build our traditional major chord, for instance, and describe it with Edo Step, you'd add the 0, 10th, and 18th scale degree of the chromatic 31 scale. To build your minor chord, you'd simply flatten the 10th scale degree by two chromatic notes. Now wait, you might ask, I thought in music theory, if you lower the third of your major chord by one scale degree, then you get the minor version of that chord. Yes, absolutely, in traditional theory, that's how it works. But remember, we're in 31, not 12, where we have more notes in between our notes. This brings up an interesting possibility in chord construction. If this is minor, and this is major, then what's this? 
This, ladies and gentlemen, is the neutral court. We are entering the neutral zone now. It's neutral third, housing it ambiguously between minor and major. Kin of both but distinctly neither. On the same line of thinking, if we push down the third of our minor chord one degree, we get what is called the subminor. And if we push up the third of our major chord by one degree, we get the super major. Through these types of harmonies, we can reinterpret any song through the lens of 31. Stephen thought True Love Waits would be ideal for this kind of reinterpretation, in part because of its unique chord structure. True Love Waits opens with a thirdless C major seven chord voiced like this. In our version, we raised the seventh, so B is now B half sharp, changing the implied quality of the chord to now be C super major seven without its third. I think the distance from our root C and our half sharp seventh, B half sharp, provides us some license here. If we voice them closer together like this, the dissonance between B half sharp and C would be way more jarring than the distance between a regular minor second style voicing of B and C. But when we give them their due space, the half sharp B has a way of justifying itself. It sits right at home, creating a unique chord color that we wouldn't have access to had we stayed in 12. And more than that, and this is the strangest thing, in the context of this arrangement, the ear seems to acclimate to the super major quality so quickly, so effectively, that if I play you the 12 tet version, which the song was written and recorded in, it, it somehow almost sounds wrong. This B half sharp is nice and all, but it's not just there to spice things up. It sets up a necessary shift to this A half sharp sub minor seven chord we go to next. One of the challenges you'll face in arranging chord progressions in 31, if you're new to it, but have a decent grasp of traditional Western theory, is how to blend standard harmony with non-standard harmony. Simply try to blend in. You'll want to know how to go from one chord to another smoothly in a way that doesn't feel disjointed or forced. We blend into the background so perfectly that no one can see it. A great way of doing this is to find and accentuate common tones between standard chords and chords that maybe live in a more nebulous space. Say you're on a C major chord and you want to follow up with A minor. Normally a move from a major chord C to its relative minor, A minor, would present no problem. They flow well into each other largely because they share two common tones, C and E. However, if we wanted to go from C major to say A half sharp minor, the jump wouldn't flow in the same way because Technically, they don't share any of the same notes. Any movement from our initial chord to our target chord would, by definition, have to involve at least a small amount of motion from each note that makes up the chord. There's a lot of reasons why you might actually prefer this motion, but assuming you don't, a thing you might try is to change a note or two within your initial chord to match your target chord. If we raise the third, the E in our initial chord, C major, to match the fifth, E half sharp of our A half sharp minor chord, we do, two things. We transform the chord quality of our initial chord from major to super major, and now that we have a common tone to pivot on, the motion between these two chords will be more stable. We took that approach on this arrangement by going from our C super major 7 to our A half sharp sub minor 7 by pivoting on the B half sharp that they both share. A big shift then happens when we go from an A sub minor seventh chord to an A sesquiflat super major. We really wanted to exaggerate some of the bass motion that was happening in the original progression from A to A flat. If you exaggerate them in either direction, you get a very large interval instead of it just sounding like a semitone. So imagine that your A has become A half sharp and your A flat has become A sesquiflat. Now you have a larger distance between the two notes, such that that root movement doesn't sound normal, but everything else still fits in. Here's what the original 12 tet progression sounds like, as compared to a more exaggerated 31 approach.
there's something a bit more sinister in the 31 arrangement, like a dark lament of sorts that lends itself to the core of True Love Waits as an expression of raw emotion. This is really the strength of 31 EDO. It can help subtly shift colors around and help us tell a more nuanced story. Because at the end of the day, that's what all of this is about. Through music, being able to tell a convincing and emotionally compelling story. As composers, as arrangers, as songwriters, it's our job to connect with an audience. And sometimes that means exploring new territory like sesquiflat subminor harmony. But sometimes that means pulling back. 31 has a tendency to be really strange to our ears because it's just something that we're not used to. So my goal here in this project as a vocal arranger was to kind of bring in that human element that you could identify with so it wouldn't sound so alien to you. This is Braylon Addison. Braylon is a multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, sound engineer, filmmaker, and bandmate in our shared project, Paper Architect. We sat down to discuss our thoughts on 31 and its role in this arrangement. When you use piano in a context of 31, it has a tendency to sound out of tune. And so I wanted to emphasize the 12 tone um, equal temperament that kind of exists within 31 uh, and lean on that as my like kind of anchor point to guide you through the rest of the track. Um, I think that Radiohead's composition and arrangement here is a very alienating composition overall anyway. So I wanted to make sure that the core of the track was still preserved while exploring outwards more. And I thought that by using 12 tone, it would be a, a good anchor to guide the listener throughout the track. Sure, so making it palatable, like adding a little bit of spice, but not too much. Exactly, yeah. Cause I think, especially with this project, all Radiohead fans are really used to 12 tone. So branching out and doing something completely 31 might be a little jarring. So I, I, again, I wanted to focus on that 12 tone to kind of take some inspiration from the original track, uh, but still apply it in this new 31 context. Microtonality, and I'm gonna get a lot of flack for saying this, but I'm just gonna say it, is um, it tends to be a little bit esoteric. Uh, the compositions historically have been math-based, they've been living in a very academic sphere, um, and it seems that uh, the emotional content sometimes takes the back burner to uh, the exploration of these larger EDOs. How did you approach this arrangement, other than uh, singing mostly in, in the context of 12, to pull on the emotional content of the song? For this arrangement, I wanted to rely on unconventional vocal techniques, or perhaps non-traditional would be a better word for it, where I'm not hyper-focusing on pitch accuracy, um, I'm using unconventional diction and phrasing to the point where I'm like allowing my voice to break, because I really wanted to highlight how 31 could be used in a more pop or uh, familiar context. And by really stressing a, a vocal performance, I think, gives the listener an in to the song uh, to, again, have it be s explorative while also s having some semblance of 12 tone. And I really wanted to have a raw performance in which emotion takes the highest point on the pedestal above 31 tet or above intellectualizing the temperament. I, I, so I wanted to put that focus on the vocal and by using styles that were, would be considered wrong, I think allows you to kind of access the song and to allow your ear to be more used to things being wrong. And so by having things be off pitch, because that's what 31 will sound like to somebody that's not used to it. It'll sound off pitch or off kilter or esoteric. And by kind of leaning into that, I think it allows a, a more expressive performance out of out of the vocals. By itself, the Lumitone might seem a little bit jarring, but in combination with what you're singing, it opens up the palette in a way that uh, it doesn't feel necessarily off-putting. And especially by the end of the track, you're so engrossed in it that when the ending chords play, 
it's you kind of are enveloped so much in 31 that you don't even realize that you're not in 12. And I, I think you you hit on something that's really important there. Uh, in preparation for this, I was originally going to just try and sing it in 31, and I realized that as a vocalist who has spent all of my life singing in 12 tone, that that was a really difficult feat to accomplish. And it ultimately led to a vocal performance that sounded forced or sounded like I was trying too hard. And so I decided to scrap that. Um, the decision to sing in 12 tone was uh, a decision that I made after doing a couple takes and I was like, this just isn't working. And so that was the, the thing that I really wanted to emphasize was not having this be a, a super alien experience the entire time. And I think by having the vocals exist in this layer where it, you kind of focus on that and start to have the 31 harmony kind of sit in the fore, uh, in the background, uh, it allowed me to have a more emotional performance. And I think that is the, the resonance in this track. And that's the hook is the vocal. And so by having it natural, instead of trying to be pigeon held in, in 31, uh, allowed me to have a more natural performance, and I think that's what really sells this arrangement. Two points on on um, selling the arrangement, which is, um, first, I, I think subtlety speaks volumes. Um, you don't want to alienate your audience too much. So you, so the, I, I think the best way to approach um, 31, or really any EDO that's not 12, if, if you're you know that your audience is going to have predominantly, you know, westernized ears, as it were, um, is to incorporate it subtly because no one's going to buy it wholesale. If, if you lean really hard into those adverse harmonies, uh, it'll just sound off-putting and no one's going to actually listen to your track. And that's, that, that's point one. And point, point two is, um, while it might have been more true to form, so to speak, to sing in 31, it wasn't comfortable to you as a vocalist. And because of that, it, 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 will, it would have shown up in your performance had you gone ahead and, and done the thing in 31. It would have been a less compelling song. And I think that's important. At the end of the day, as, like microtonalists are musicians, and musicians need to connect. That connection is to the audience, to the people around you, is the most important thing. And so you can't, you can only sacrifice so much. And at the end of the day, you must do what serves the song. That was a really natural decision to make that I, I kind of did on the spot. And that is the spontaneity that you, I think in general, in a 31 context or a 12 context, if you are comfortable and you are, as a performer, able to go into uh, an energy space like True Love Waits, which is such a, a, a richly uh, complex emotional song, um, anything that allows you to get into the song and, and perform and give a genuine honest expression of uh, what the song's talking about, uh, then that's a technique that you should apply regardless if you're singing in 12 or, or 31. I think it's so interesting to hear the dichotomy and mindsets between these two guys because they have wildly different approaches toward the same goal. Above all else, they each wanna serve the song. The Lumitone leans on non-traditional harmonies that beg the attention of the listener. But at the same time, Braylon's vocal sits squarely in the comfort of tradition, which allows the listener to feel at home while exploring something new. To you, what is True Love Waits about? That's a, that's, that's a hard question. Because I, I, I think at the end of the day, True Love Waits is a, I would describe it as a self-deprecating song in the sense that it, it's exploring emotions that, like the lyric, true love lives on lollipops and crisps. That's, to me, a very, like, destructive lyric, and where you're... True love... It's painting this picture of true love being... Uh, yearning's a, a, too mild of a word for it... Uh, perhaps an obsessive quality to the song. So True Love Waits is about that feeling, at least to me, of being so hopelessly in love with someone, something, that you starve yourself, you change your appearance, uh, I'll dress like your niece. Um, 
it, it, it's sacrificing yourself for this weird ideal of uh, a toxic love. And it, it's speaking to the qualities of like what love could do to a person if they're malnourished in spirit. Does the idea of reinterpreting this song in the context of 31 lend itself to what the song is about? I believe so. I, I think part of the reason why my vocal performance was so raw and was so spontaneous in the decision to take a 12 tone approach to it. Um, I was listening to the guiding piano track over and over again. And I think 31 kind of exaggerated that feeling of uh, how did, that's a really difficult feeling to describe. Um, it kind of emphasized like the numbness of that constant yearning and I think because it was so alien, at least while I was listening to it, it did take me some time to kind of acclimate my ears to what I was trying to sing along with. And I think because it's so jarring, it, it plays really well with the original arrangement because this is a really jarring song. It's talking about love in a way that is not typically discussed. And I think that really drew an emotional performance out of me because I was just feeling so alienated and left like cast out in, in while listening to it. And be, because it like 31 is still alien to my ears and I'm still trying to really have that be a, a more normal uh, system. And because of that alienation, it, it, it did affect my performance. And so I think, Reinterpreting Two Love Waits in a 31 context definitely added to that vulnerability or that alienation feeling. Well, in speaking to that feeling, I hope you enjoy our 31 tone arrangement of Radiohead's True Love Waits.
Special thank you to Steven and Braylon for helping me out on this project. For all things microtonal, please check out Steven's podcast, Now and Zen. I'll put the link in the description along with his YouTube, and he just joined TikTok, so go and follow him there. Please check out Braylon's YouTube videos for like the highest quality videos exploring what it means to be a musician. Seriously, he is one of the most underrated YouTubers I have ever seen. He also has an album out, which is fantastic. It's called Weather for Gardening. Please go check it out. All links will be in the description. Oh yeah, and please subscribe, ring the notification bell, and drop a comment below. I'm gonna to respond to all of them again and I will see you in a few weeks on a video about the music theory of geology and the human condition.